Hello, friend. Thanks for joining me for another book chat. Today, let's spend a few minutes with A Distant Mirror, The Calamitous 14th Century by Barbara Tuckman. This work of history was originally published in 1978, and it is the second of the Barbara Tuckman histories that I have read and chatted here on my channel. I previously chatted the Zimmerman Telegram, so I will link to that chat down in the details below. I've read through most of these histories of hers in the past, but it's been a really long time ago. So this is actually a reread for me, but it was so long ago when I read this, I think the 1980s, that it basically was a new book for me again. So A Distant Mirror by Barbara Tuckman. The 14th century, Barbara Tuckman argues at the beginning of the book is sort of a distant mirror, hence the title, to the 20th century when she wrote this book. She compared the different centuries as far as the different social turmoil that was going on in the 14th century as opposed to in the 20th century. I'm not sure that I saw the connection so much in the 20th century. Uh, for one, one of the main things that happened in the 14th century was the Black Plague, and the 20th century didn't have that level of plague, uh, you know, and so that seems like that was sort of a fundamental thing from the 14th century. But nevertheless, the 14th century had the Hundred Years' War. It had the Black Plague, like I mentioned. There was a papal schism that was pretty amazing. The Ottoman Empire was expanding at the time and really threatening Europe. So in that sense, there was a comparison to the 20th century. 20th century, there was a lot of social upheaval, a social like mobility and change. And this was in the 14th century, this was partially due to the Black Death, but also due in part to the changing economy, where the market economy was uh, actually being born. And in the 20th century, the economy really expanded after World War II, and there was a lot of social mobility, and that created a lot of social unrest, sort of in comparison to the 14th century. The papal schism, you know, we didn't necessarily have a papal schism in the 20th century, but there was a lot of religious sort of turmoil and instability as the as the population's view of religion was changing pretty rapidly and radically. So, yeah, the way the book is structured, Barbara Tuckman, she picks a character, a real-life character from the 14th century, and his name is Angoran de Cousy, and I'm probably mispronouncing that or not pronouncing that entirely in the correct French way. He was a nobleman, a French nobleman, and his life uh, spanned 1340 to 1397, so almost the whole 14th century, and he was a nobleman, and so he was very well placed in as far as the events that happened in the 14th century. Now, I should say this book is focusing on Western Europe, so it's the focus is mainly France because Angoran de Cousy, that's where he is, and the, he's our sort of our focal character, but also France's relationship then with England and the other uh, regions where they have uh, things going on like Switzerland and Italy and whatnot. But it is focused really on Western Europe. So when we're talking about the 14th century, this is not a global survey of the 14th century around the entire world. It is a survey of the 14th century of Western Europe. So, um, Angaran de Cousy, actually another way that he was sort of well connected is that he married Isabella, the daughter of King Edward III of England. So, he is tied to the royal family of England. Now, the nation-state system, this was one of the most interesting things to me about the book, was that the nation-state system did not, uh, it's not, was not like it is today, you know, like it eventually developed. And so they didn't have this sense of, I'm a French person and I'm married to this English woman, so therefore I have some sort of allegiance to England or whatever. It was strictly based on the monarch and who you owed sort of fealty to. And so I thought that was a really interesting uh, thing, uh, difference. And the other thing about that was how that was changing throughout the 14th century. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that when it came to chivalry here in a bit. 
there's a lot in this book that I could talk about, though. I mean, we could spend uh, we could spend a whole hour or more on it just talking about the different aspects of this book. But what I thought I would do is approaching this chat is just pull out some things that I marked as I was reading it that I found just particularly interesting. They're not necessarily the most important things in the book, but they were just things that I pulled out and marked as I was going along uh, as points of interest. And I, I did sort of mention about the rise of the social mobility, you know, the rise of the mercantile class that was going on at this time. And it was really interesting to me that there were closed laws. So because of this strain, like the nobility didn't like newly wealthy merchants trying to dress like them or emulate them in any way, because as the mercantile class got more money, they wanted to adopt sort of the dress and the manners of the more elites, right? The the aristocrats, the nobles, and the nobles did not like that. And they actually had laws in place that, you know, if you were of this class or of this profession, you could only wear certain clothes, certain types of cloth, certain types of clothes. And I thought that was just amazing, you know, really. Um, the other thing is that the financial structure of nation states at the time didn't exist yet, as I mentioned. And so it was really the monarch, you know, it was really based still on the nobility and the monarch. And so the money was a continuous sort of issue as far as like raising money as, um, for different endeavors. The monarch would need m many times to go to the nobles and they would have to contribute money to whatever cause it was. This was changing though in the 14th century but an interesting thing at the beginning of the 14th century in 1314 was the destruction of the knights templar because of their wealth and the their wealth was coveted by the monarchy of the time and ultimately that they got the the wealth of the templars by destroying them but that sort of dynamic was something that was new in the in the 14th century and I thought that was really interesting. So another thing that was about just the way that the church still controlled every aspect of life. So like time, the church, uh, time followed the, the, the religious calendar. So the new year began in March. It, t it actually formally, I think, was at Easter. But the year, the calendar year was the circular thing based on the church calendar not on the, you know, a fixed calendar. So therefore, because the new year actually began on Easter, that date actually changes every year a little bit, right? So uh, dating things can be somewhat challenging during this era. Um, so the French language is, is in England, the French language, so the French language was the dominant language in England still during this time, although it was starting to change. And I think after the plague, it even changed more where the the really the official language of the court of England was French. And I think she makes the point in the book even that Edward III might not have even been able to speak English uh, because the noble class, the aristocratic class, spoke um spoke french and but there was uh because of the social mobility of the time there be, became became a uh, sort of a resentment of that that why would we need to learn this different language when we already have our own language you know um so i thought that was really interesting so i mentioned about the black plague there's quite a bit in the book about that uh, it it uh, as far as like the impact that it had and it was uneven you know and I, I, don't, I don't think i had ever really realized that how uneven it could be like some regions the death rate was really really high like 50 percent or more and then other regions other places it might not be and there didn't seem to be any logic to it uh so people couldn't really figure out you know what's uh what was what was happening there and the this psychological and religious and spiritual and every other aspect of life that was impacted by the plague is just really hard to underestimate so it was just a, this major event and it's just really interesting how that how they came through that there's a quote i didn't write the quote down but there's a quote i believe from petrarch that's something about like the future reader of this account that he was writing wouldn't even believe it was true because it was so, um, I guess, horrific. 
Um, another thing I wrote down was about this dancing craze that happened. I believe this was in um, the Rhineland. Yeah, I wrote down the Rhineland. It wasn't related to the plague, but there were lots of these sort of like little cult things that popped up because of the plague. But this one wasn't the plague. It was just one of these sort of things as, so, as you know, as there's social sort of instability, a lot of these sort of like these instances like this dancing craze can, can pop up where... Um, sort of constraints are lifted in one way or another. But there was this place in the Rhineland where people just started dancing like crazy, right? And they would just dance themselves into exhaustion in the middle of the street. Um, and it just popped up out of nowhere. It did have a religious connotation. I believe they thought they were being uh, sort of driven to do the dance by demons. But yeah, it didn't have anything to really necessarily to do with the play. I just thought that was just such a fascinating sort of social thing to have happened. Um, all right, so the decline of chivalry, I mentioned this at the beginning, sort of how chivalry was changing as far as um, the structure of how decisions were made, like um, decisions in war and things. And, and France really held on to this notion of chivalry longer than other places like England. So in warfare was actually an aristocratic endeavor during chivalry, but it was changing. And so in England, they got like the longbow, they got different, like technology was being developed where non-aristocrats became sort of the, the important people right in a war because they were the skilled people who could use this new technology and um so it was changing chivalry though uh hung on and the the aristocratic class really tried to to keep a hold of it for as long as they as they could um so i thought that was really interesting it's really described really well in the book and i'm not ex describing it probably too well here but i did uh find it extremely interesting so to close so the castle of of uh, Angaran de Cousy lasted for like 700 years. During World War I, there was a German general, I guess, that this area, Picardy, was occupied by the Germans and um, there was, they were going to blow it up. And there was someone who tried to like argue against blowing it up because it's this 700 year old architectural treasure, right? But the general, would not accept that. He decided to make an example of the castle. So it was dynamited. And the book sort of ends on this quote about the ruins of the castle that are still there to this day. And the quote says, for 700 years, the castle had withstood cycles of human endeavor and failure, order and disorder, greatness and decline. Its ruins remain on the hilltop in Picardy, silent observers as history's wheels turn. I just think that is such a beautiful quote, silent observers as history's wheels turn. On that note, I will leave this chat here. I did enjoy this history very much. However, my next chat, I'm going to switch gears into some mystical spirituality, Hymn of the Universe by Pierre Tillyard de Chardin. And I will have a chat on this coming up soon. So until next time, take care.